Welcome to Right Soul. We're so glad you're here. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome to the weekly online video worship service for the Wrightsville United Methodist Church for Sunday, September 12th, 2021. I'm so glad to welcome you to the service today. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here on staff at the church. I'd like to invite you to please uh, let us know that you are worshiping with us today. And you can do that by scanning the QR code that will be on the screen a little later on. Scan that with your cell phone. It will connect you to a link uh, where you can register your attendance. Uh, you can also let us know of any prayer concerns that you may have. And we would love to hear from you and to know that you are worshiping with us today. I have a few announcements to make. One is that uh, for our church family, Realm is coming this week. That's our new online church directory uh, app and program. You'll be getting an email about that with sign-up information uh, this week, so be on the lookout for that. And then uh, coming up in just a few weeks, the United Methodist Men are sponsoring the annual golf tournament. That's going to be on Monday, September the 27th. We still need players and whole sponsors. You can contact the church office for more information about the golf tournament. Also, uh, Sunday the 12th will be the uh, Sunday school kickoff for our children. Uh, we're going to be having actually a magic show in the uh, playground. So if you're watching this before Sunday, service before the early service, you've still got time to uh, get ready and come over for that. Also on Sunday afternoon, kickoff for our youth ministry for the fall with a pizza dinner and foam party. And what is a foam party, you're asking? Ah, <laughs> sounds interesting, doesn't it? Um, I'm not sure. The one thing I am certain of is that it's probably messy and fun. So uh, that's for our kids that are in the youth group, come and bring a friend for that. Also, if you would like to sign up to put flowers on the altar for our regular in-person worship services, you may do that by calling the office. You can uh, put flowers uh, on the altar in memory of a loved one or in honor of someone. Just let us know. And then finally, uh, one other announcement, and that is that uh, we have coming up on October 9th, the annual Sun Run or Walk. It's a 5K run or walk uh, with proceeds benefiting organizations in our community, particularly those that are focused on providing shelter for folks that need shelter. And to help a lot of us get ready for that, on Tuesdays at 4.15, you're invited to walk with the pastors as we walk the loop out here on uh, Riceville Beach. And uh, it, it'll be a great walk. There won't be a sermon because all the pastors will be out of breath from the walking. So it'll just be fellowship and good exercise uh, out in the fresh air. So that's Tuesdays. Um, at 4.15 in the afternoon, uh, we'll gather uh, right, uh, probably right across the street from the, the church and walk the loop. We'll do that up until the time of that uh, 5K. For more information on any of these upcoming activities, uh, feel free to call the church office. Once again, welcome to our worship service today. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
And now let us go before God in prayer. Almighty God, we come to worship you, praising you for the past and trusting you for the future. We come to join our will to your will and make your purpose our purpose and your love our love. We come to hear your word, to fellowship with fellow believers and to affirm our Christian faith. We come in the name of Jesus. Amen. Space, our fears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken, gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now, and we shall awaken, we shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light in the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Not in the dark of buildings confining, nor in some heaven light years away, but here in this place the new light is shining. Now is the kingdom, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together. Fire of love in our flesh and our bones. I invite you now to join with me as we affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 11. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I will seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. It's always an exciting time when we welcome new members into the family of faith that is Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And today we're welcoming two members through our online service. Beth Fortunato um, has been worshiping with us off and on for the last six years, but has been watching the worship service online every single week for the last year. Nick Stratus has been worshiping with us off and on for the last few years, but has also become more faithful now that we're worshiping online. Um, now that we have that access to, um, to people in different methods and different ways, it's interesting how often people are connecting with us through the online service. And, and we're welcoming uh, two members who are primarily worshiping with us through this online venue. And so we're so excited to welcome Beth and Nick today. You've both been baptized members of Christ Universal Church, so I have two questions to ask you today. The first is, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, your answer is, I will. I will. I will. Great. And as members here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, Will you be faithful to participate in its ministries through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, your answer is, I will. I will. Well, with that, I give you the holy fist bump of welcome to Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are glad that you're here. And wherever you are that you're watching, Beth and Nick, I hope that you get the opportunity to welcome them in person someday. And if, uh, if you're watching this on one of our social media platforms, why don't you just write in the comment um, uh, space, you know, hey, welcome Beth, welcome Nick, because we sure are glad to have you. Welcome to our newest members here at Wrightsville United Methodist. Nobody knows the trouble I see Nobody knows but Jesus Nobody knows the trouble I see Glory, hallelujah Right now you see me going along so Oh Lord, I've got my troubles here below, oh yes Lord, nobody knows the trouble I see, nobody knows my sorrow, nobody knows the trouble I see. Glory, hallelujah. Why does old Satan hate me so? Oh, yes, Lord. He had me once and he let me go. Oh, yes, Lord. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus Nobody knows the trouble I see Glory, hallelujah Will you please join me in prayer? Holy God, we know that you created this world and us and all that is and that when it was finished, you said it was good. But God, when we look around the world, a lot of times it doesn't seem so good. There are terrible hurricanes, earthquakes, and forest fires. There's violence in our communities and across the world. There's sickness and death and pain. We know that some of this brokenness is the result of our broken humanity of us turning away from you and instead choosing to feed our greed, anger, and pride. For where we have been wrong, God, please forgive us. Give us the strength to turn back to you and to follow your ways. Free us from the power of sin and free us for joyful obedience. 
God, we also sense that some of the evil we see isn't anyone's fault. It just is. God, we lament the senseless hurt we see in the world. We offer you now the situations that break our hearts and the names of people who are hurting, either out loud or in our hearts. Thank you, God, that you hear our prayers and that you care for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you tell us that you came that we would have life and have it abundantly. We thank you that you are working all things together for good, even when we can't see it. So in confidence of your goodness, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the opportunity to worship God by giving back a portion of what God has given to us. We know that everything that we have comes from God. And so our giving is response to the generosity that God has already shown to us. There are several ways that you can give at this time. The first is by writing a check and mailing it to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. You can also give on our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, or using our smartphone app. As we prepare now to worship God through our giving, please join me in prayer. All things come from you, O God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love you formed us in your image. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Wrightsville kids. My name is Pastor Julia, and today I'm wondering if there's something that you're really scared of. You know, one of those things that makes you feel all, Ugh. well, for me, it's spiders. I hate spiders. They're so creepy and icky and I cannot stand to be around them. I'm also really scared anytime I have to go to the doctor and get a shot. I don't like doing that at all. Now, my sister is afraid of some different things. She doesn't have any trouble getting a shot, but she's afraid of clowns. And my fiance, he's not afraid of spiders, but he's afraid of tall heights. He doesn't want to go and be on a ladder or anything like that. He wants to stay right here on the ground. Is there something that you're scared of? Maybe snakes or the dark? Well, there's a lot of different things that different people are scared of. And the reality is that, you know, being scared isn't actually such a bad thing. Sure, it's not fun to feel scared, but being afraid is a way that our bodies let us know that something is kind of dangerous. You know, it's, it's good that we're afraid of fire so that we don't try and burn our hand. Or it's good that my fiance is scared of high places so that he doesn't fall off. But there's other times when even though we're scared of something, we have to have the courage to deal with it anyway. It's just unavoidable. Like my house right now sometimes has a spider in it and I have to get over my fear enough to be able to deal with that. Or it's really important for me to get a shot to be able to still be healthy, so I have to be okay with doing something that feels scary. When I'm doing something that feels scary, I like to sing a song to myself that I learned when I was a kid. And I wanna teach you that song today. The song is from the awesome TV show Veggie Tales, so you might know it already. So I'm gonna sing the chorus one time, and then I'm gonna invite you guys to sing it with me once again. Ready? Here we go. God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Godzilla or the monsters on TV. Oh yes, and God is bigger than the boogeyman and he's watching out for you and me. Let's sing it again. God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Godzilla or the monsters on TV. God is bigger than the boogeyman and he's watching out for you and me. See, I like that song so much because it reminds us that even when we're scared, God is still with us. And we can do things that are scary and hard because we know that the God who loves us and who's so big and still in control is able to help us, to give us the courage to deal with scary things and to comfort us when we're scared. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are bigger than all of the scary things in the world. Please give us courage when we need to do something scary. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Grace and peace to you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm glad that you've chosen to spend time with us today in our worship service and would just like to remind you as you heard in the announcements and as you've probably seen on the e-blast that uh, this is kickoff Sunday, meaning we are kicking off uh, lots of new activities in the life of the church for children, youth and adults. And so I hope that you'll take the opportunity to either watch the announcements at the end of our service today or check out the e-blast and find out more about something that might appeal to you. Our scripture for today comes from Luke chapter 13, and we're going to read the first five verses. At that very time, there were some present who told him, Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? 
No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are with us in good times and bad. Lord, I pray that you will lift our spirit closer to heaven, Lord, so that we might connect with you, know you, and better understand and live by your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once or twice, maybe even three times in our sojourn upon this earth, Something happens that shapes the course of a great many lives all at once. For my grandparents, it was Pearl Harbor. My parents will tell you just where they were when they heard the news of President John F. Kennedy's assassination. For me and my generation, and for many of you who are watching today, it was September 11th, 2001, 20 years ago yesterday. And I suspect in the future, my kids will tell my grandkids what it was like living during the time of the COVID pandemic. For some people, their lives were turned upside down just last week when Hurricane Ida brought storm surge, winds, and flooding rainfall to communities from Louisiana all the way to New York and New Jersey. We've been through something like that too. In fact, on Tuesday, it'll be the three-year anniversary of Hurricane Florence coming to the Wilmington area. Others will note that last week marked the 25th anniversary of Hurricane Fran making landfall along the Cape Fear coast. Pandemics, terrorist attacks, natural disasters. These aren't common everyday events, thankfully, but we've experienced them all in different ways. They've taken thousands of lives and left behind millions who have been affected emotionally, economically, and even spiritually. It's that last part that I want to talk about today. These horrible tragedies raise fundamental questions about life. Like, why is there so much chaos in the first place? Why does nature so overwhelm us and destroy our lives? Why do innocent people suffer? Where was God on September 11th, 2001? Where was God on December 26, 2004, when 230,000 perished almost instantly in the Asian tsunami? Where was God last week, when the storm waters grew deeper and deeper from Hurricane Ida? Where has he been for the last 18 months? Well, we've been dealing with an illness that's now taken four and a half million lives around the world. I apologize if I in any way come across trite. I certainly do not wish to be. But I'm struck by how universal these questions are. They're as old as Job and are asked by the wisest people among us. For years, people have sought out answers for the questions of suffering. And we're still searching. So what do we do when nature overwhelms us or when people conspire to create monstrous works of evil or when viruses can't be contained? Who's in control here? Nature? People? God? Let's take a look at nature. Are our lives simply subject to the whims of nature or does God somehow use the forces of nature to accomplish his will? In other words, does God cause all these earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes? Before we answer this question, let me draw attention to something that we all do as humans. We ask questions. And questions are hard to answer in tragic times. But we ask them anyway. It's only human, and the Bible sees it as a very human thing to do, especially in hard times. If you were to take a tour of the Bible, you would find that there's one book that has a disproportionate number of questions, and that's the book of Job. Job has over 330 questions in its 42 chapters. Compare that to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, a much longer book than Job. It only has 160 questions. Or Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, has around 180, 
And that's odd because it seems like Jesus is asking questions of his listeners all the time. Even the book of Psalms, with its 150 chapters, only has 160 questions. So why does the book of Job have so many questions? Simple. It's because the book of Job deals with a horrible tragedy, and we all question tragedy. You remember, Job is a righteous man, a great man in his time. Suddenly, without warning, his family and business are completely wiped out. Two rogue groups, one from Arabia, the other from Mesopotamia, conduct raids, taking away Job's livestock and putting his servants to the sword. Then his family is lost in a freak accident where a mighty wind sweeps in from the desert, striking the four corners of his house, collapsing it, and all are lost. It is swift. It is unwarranted. It is unconscionable. And of course, Job is devastated. In many ways, the events of our own past sometimes seem eerily echoed in the book of Job. When tragedy strikes, we wonder, now what? You know, we tend to do what Job did when he learned of his loss. We mourn. He was silent when he received the first two reports that his business and livestock had been wiped out. Those can be replaced. But when he received the news that his children were lost, he got up and he tore his robe. Then he fell on his knees and he wept and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will return. Everything that had meaning in his life was gone. As he came into this world, so Job felt like he was leaving it without anything completely naked. Did God make the mighty winds that collapsed so many homes along the coasts of Louisiana and Mississippi last week? Did he plan out the floods that devastated the Northeast? Of course not. Did God have some great purpose in all of this? No. Were the purpose people of these states any worse sinners than any of the rest of us? No. I consider myself fortunate that in our day we've come to see that there are other explanations for why we have these disastrous storms. Hurricanes arrive not because God has a habit of punishing people who live close to the coastline, but rather because the prevailing winds and the ocean currents and the frontal zones combine in ways that make tropical storms more likely this time of year. The same is true of earthquakes, tornadoes, or floods. All of these are directed by the forces of nature. This is so in good times and in bad, and without respect to the moral climate or the condition of the people who happen to be living in the region where these things take place. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 that God causes the sun to rise on the good and the bad and for the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. The God we meet in the pages of Scripture is not some vicious, violent, judgmental, capricious force in the world. Instead, we find a very different God in Scripture. John tells us that God is love and that perfect love of God casts out all fear. But for now, let's move from the acts of nature to the acts of humankind. For all that nature has done to wreak havoc upon the earth, humans have done even worse. Luke 13 offers a chilling look at how Jesus might address our own inhumanity toward each other. Let's read it again. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. You see, in this text, we have a tragic national event in the life of Israel during Jesus' time. It's a headline event that's discussed by everyone within the nation of Israel. There are actually two events. One of the events appears to be an accidental collapse of a structure of a building site that kills 18 people who are standing nearby. 
And the other was a military operation against civilians ordered by Pontius Pilate. That event seems to be political or maybe even religious. You're well aware that Israel during the time of Jesus had been conquered by Rome. Rome's presence was a constant reminder that they were a nation under siege. The people learned to live with this, but there remained this great tension. A religious underground had actually emerged to fight for freedom against the Romans. Pilate, Rome's representative, was despised. And it's apparent from this text that Pilate ruled in a ruthless manner. Some people who, we don't know, come to Jesus to discuss this incident at the temple. Pilate, you see, angered by something that had occurred in Galilee, decided to make an example of a group of Galilean Jews who were visiting the capital of Jerusalem. He ordered his soldiers to go into the temple in the middle of the day while there were tens of thousands of people worshiping there and execute these Galileans. This is done to send the Jews a message. If you don't keep yourselves under control, you will suffer the consequences of Rome's might. It was a strong reminder of the suffering that the Jews endured under Rome. Pilate sent a political and religious message by slaying a group of men who were more likely than not completely innocent. Now, the Galilean territory may have done something that set Pilate off, but these men who were murdered quite likely had nothing to do with it. They were convenient in the wrong place, at the wrong time. Why is the story in the Bible? It's there because the disciples wanted to ask Jesus a very specific question. They wanted to know if these people died because they had sinned. Was this God's judgment because of their immoral living? Jesus gives a very simple answer. No. He then goes on to say, you, he's talking to the disciples, he said, you must repent or you will likewise perish. In other words, these things happen, unfortunately. Life can sometimes be indiscriminate. One day you're here and the next day you die in a car accident or from COVID or whatever. So repent. Get right with God. Now this tells me something very important. God is not up there pulling all the strings. God does not control the world in this way. There is chaos. There is evil. There is uncertainty. It would be dishonest to say that God makes everything all right in this world. For tragedies do happen. The death of 3,000 innocent souls who are simply going to work on September 11th tells me how warped and depraved some people can be. Now don't get me wrong, I as much as anyone have hope in the resurrection. I simply cannot deny the picture that is painted by Psalm 77 when it asks, Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Sometimes it seems like God has just left the planet and isn't coming back. Pastor Julia asked me this past week what it was like being a pastor right after 9-11. I told her I was an associate pastor and youth director up in the North Carolina mountains during that time. And it was hard being a pastor. We all felt so vulnerable, so violated, so afraid. We couldn't believe that something like that had happened right here in the United States. She let me reminisce about how I spoke to the youth group the day after 9-11. I told her I was part of a ministerial alliance where different pastors were given an hour on the radio every day for a week to speak to the citizens of Franklin, North Carolina and the surrounding community. And my week just happened to be the week after 9-11. This was way before satellite radio. In fact, you could only get two radio stations in that area. So I spoke to thousands on the air each morning. I rambled on to Julia about how, you know, you know just some of the things that I did during that time and what I said and did in my sermon. Uh, the following week. We talked about the mood of the country during that time, for good and for bad. One of the positive things that happened was there was a sense of national unity that I'm not sure we've really had since. One of the bad things was there, 
was that there was a lot of anti-Muslim hate crimes and rhetoric in the U.S. right after 9-11. Tara and I, we lived in the next town over from Franklin, closer to her job than to mine. And on that long winding road between where I lived and where I worked, there was just one lone gas station. It was owned by a Pakistani gentleman who, quite honestly, was one of the few people of color in that area. My friends and I started talking. We were getting worried about the gas station and its owner after 9-11 and wondered if anything might happen to him. Well, indeed it did. On my way home from church, I saw a lot of trucks outside the gas station the day after 9-11. Many more vehicles than would normally be there at that time of night. The next day, I saw a large group of trucks again, and again the night after that. I started asking around the community what was going on each night and found out that a bunch of the neighbors had heard about what was happening to Muslim people in other cities and towns and had decided they were going to take matters into their own hands. So they showed up every night for weeks, it might have even been months, to protect the only Muslim people that they knew in that community. A Pakistani man and his family who owned the local gas station and they made sure nothing would happen to him. Where is God when terrible tragedies befall us? Where was God on 9-11? Hear me out. He was not in the cockpit of those planes. God was not in the hurricane that ripped through Louisiana last week. He was not in the floodwaters that swamped New Jersey and New York. He did not cause these things to happen. I'll tell you where God is. He's there in the last moments of loved ones trying to love one another to help them get out of harm's way. He's there in the firefighter suit. He's there behind the police badge. He's behind the scalpel, the syringe, and the mask. He's there in the National Guard, the Red Cross, UMCOR, EMTs, Salvation Army, FEMA, neighbors, and churches. He's near the heart of all who, in the face of these tragedies, love their neighbor and turn to God in repentance. Who, in the floodwaters of life, look to him not just for answers, but because in the end, tragedies teach us that we are mortal and we are fully dependent on God. What should we do? We should mourn, yes. We should lament, yes. But we should also rebuild. We should rebuild our lives as soon as we honor in death all those who have perished from the virus, the violence, and the floods. Who is to blame? Blame it on the wind. Blame it on the rain. Blame it on our inadequacies to prepare for such tragedies. But don't don't blame it on God. Where is God? He is here. Anguish is no stranger to God. Let us never forget that Jesus suffered. He died, but he was raised. Therefore, I have hope even when the waters come up to my neck. I have hope even when I sink in the miry depths. I have hope even when the flood waters engulf me. I have hope even when buildings fall. I have hope even when illness seems unabated. I have hope because love is poured out on me by God and my neighbor. I have hope because the Spirit is alive and active in this world. I have hope because God has rescued me in the past and I know he'll do it again. I have hope because the church continues to shine as a light into the darkness. And I have hope because when Jesus died, he rose on the third day. Therefore, I will always have hope. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, you have taught us throughout history that even in death, there is resurrection. Lord, we mourn the loss of life and our lifestyles that have been changed by so much disaster and tragedy. Lord, we ask that you will help us to rebuild, to 
to reconnect, to rejoin, and Lord, to once again live. Live the life abundantly that you have called us to live. We ask this in the name of your Son, who rose from the grave. Amen. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore. Where could I go but to the Lord? Today and every day, I invite you to remember that after Jesus went to the cross, he arose from the tomb on the third day. Even in the midst of death, we have hope because there's resurrection. God gives us hope in the worst of times. Those moments can be redeemed 
Good times are still to come. We always have hope because we believe in the one who has conquered death, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So go in peace and go in faith. In Jesus' name, amen.